I recently watched a Neil Oliver interview with a climate alarmist. I, I see many of these on television, but I thought I would take this as an example. And I was so, how can I put it, frustrated is the word, by the responses of the climate alarmists that I simply had to dissect the interview and give you my opinions on just how wrong this man was um, with evidence and facts as usual. So um, I think Neil Oliver does a good job in this interview given the constraints he's got. Um, but I, I would just like, let me say, to get rid of my frustration by dissecting the interview and, and giving you some responses to the alarmist narrative. Joining me now to contemplate how close we are to the end of life on Earth is environmental campaigner Donica McCarthy. Uh, Donica, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? Do, do, do you take the position that there's no more debate worth having, that it's a settled deal? Nobody says there's no more debate worth having. What we are saying is that the vast majority of scientific bodies in the world agree with the current science. Science, as you know, I have a, a background in science, never sense anything is 100% certain. However, the current scientists believe it's above 95% certainty that the, the burning of fossil fuels is contributing to global could do the global breakdown that's now happening around the world, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Well, he's made a number of mistakes uh, already, and it shows a pretty high level of ignorance on the subject. The first mistake is his appeal to authority, which is unacceptable in science. A central lesson of science that to understand complex issues, for even simple ones, we must try to free our minds of dogma and to guarantee the freedom to publish to contradict and to experiment. Arguments from authority are unacceptable. Carl Sagan, a famous scientist. But one more quote, which maybe puts it in a better way. Just as expected, the preacher retreated to authority as soon as he feared his ideas could not stand on their own merit. Reasonable argument was impossible when authority became the arbiter. Orson Scott Card, Seventh Son. And there we have it, you see, just appealing to authority, saying, I am this, and this is the authority is wrong. And besides anything else, there is no evidence anywhere whatsoever that 95% agree. In fact, there is a lot of evidence to the opposite. His mistake number two, when he refers to the breakdown in weather around the world, the breakdown in climate around the world, shows a complete ignorance of the difference between weather and climate. Climate is weather over a long period of time studying a pattern. It is not an individual year's drought. It is not even a five or ten year sequence of weather. It is a long term period. You've got to have like 50, 60, 70, 100, 200 years or something to even begin to look at patterns in climate. Some of the cycles are longer than that. Some of the cycles are shorter. But those cycles are fundamental to understanding climate. And what he's done here is he's mixed up climate with the recent events in Europe, the scaremongering. But let's first of all, where there's appeal to authority, what does authority have to say about these recent weather events? Well, let's look at the IPCC, his god of authority. Let's look at that and what they say about extreme weather events, because it may surprise you. So here we are. The IPCC has concluded that a signal of climate change has not yet emerged beyond natural variability for the following phenomena. Now, uh, natural is, you know, in the natural cycle of things, you have to find something different. So they can't find any increasing or decreasing river floods, heavy precipitation and pluvial floods, landslides, drought of all types, severe windstorms, tropical cyclones, sand and dust storms, heavy snow and fall and ice storms, hail, snow avalanche, coastal flooding and marine heat waves. So there's quite a list there that even the IPCC say you can't claim when you have these weather events <laughs> that they're a change or attributed to a change in climate. In actual fact, I disagree with a few of those because as a water resource engineer, for example, I know that droughts have decreased and floods have decreased. I know that almost all of those weather events actually are less now than they were in the past or at least no worse. So now let's take a look at those forest fires in southern Europe. This is the historic record since 1980. 
And as you can see, if you look at the number of fires on the left, that's the total number, you know, they rose up and then they've declined. So of late here, they've declined. That's the overall for the all five countries. Look to the right graph and you'll find a constant decline in the amount that's been burnt, in the acreage burnt. So it simply is not true to claim these are, you know, getting worse and worse. But you see, facts don't matter to these people. What we're arguing here was a man who's in a cult and whose very livelihood probably now depends on perpetuating that cult. Oh, and for the record, I've used the official European fire database graphs and figures in this. But let us now continue with this interview by Neil Oliver. And by the way, Neil Oliver is a man I have a great deal of respect for and he has particular rules when interviewing, so he can't do what I'm doing here that easily. It would be much easier if it was an alternative guest on with the knowledge to counter this cultist. Something, as a non-scientist, that perplexes me is the, is the idea of net zero, as though there, we're working towards having no carbon dioxide. <laughs> Presumably that can't be the objective, because without CO2 there's no plant life and thereby no life. Sure, as a non-scientist, you have absolutely misunderstood that. Great condescending language there from a man who doesn't even understand the difference between weather and climate and uses fake alarmism like the recent weather events in Europe to, to bolster his flimsy case. It, the idea of if we eliminate a carbon from the atmosphere, we would die. Yeah. There, would be no, there would be no life on Earth. What we are saying is that if we actually throw out a million years worth of carbon every year by burning fossil fuels and we keep doing that, that million years of worth of carbon added to the planet will cause the planet to heat. It was actually discovered by a scientist called John Tyndall, not far from here in Southwark, in the 1850s doing science. He found certain gases have a tendency to trap heat. So therefore, and carbon dioxide is one of those, and because we are emitting so much extra carbon in the atmosphere, it's causing this disaster that's now unfolding. Here we are, nice and contrite. This disaster that's now unfolding, what disaster? We're having fewer forest fires in Europe than we've had in the past, in the recent past. We have these cycles in, in things, as you can see, with the IPCC claiming on most things, most extreme weather events, they can't actually distinguish between natural and whether it's caused by CO2, and the science isn't there for CO2. I'll give a link to some of the videos um, that I've made, like more CO2, please, in the description to this video. And I'll also give one about the natural cycles, about the cooling that's coming. And those two videos are really worth watching, I think, especially combined together. But this man, again, is using extreme weather alarmism without any scientific foundation, using scare tactics against all the evidence. I always use evidence. I use facts and evidence to counter these people. This man is going off into a little story about how Tyndall you know, came up with a CO2 problem, but that, that was a tiny experiment, if you like, in glass jars almost. It is not how CO2 works in the atmosphere. It's 420 parts per million at the moment. That's 0.04%, and it was, in pre-industrial, about Two, uh, 285 parts per million. Um, all we've done is add a huge beneficial amount to the planet of CO2 that over the millennia has been buried and buried and buried. And had we carried on, we'd have just extinguished all life on Earth because we'd have buried all the CO2. It's a great thing, a great thing to humanity that we're now releasing it. But I, let's go back to the subject. I'd love to take this one apart. <laughs> Let's go back to the subject and just what he's saying here. It's now unfolding. I read over and over again that CO2 lags behind a warming planet by, I keep on seeing, 800 years, that a pl the planet warms and then more CO2 is released so that it's not the CO2 that's warming the planet, but that the planet is becoming warmer for some other reason, and that releases off gases more CO2. Is that wrong? It, that's a theory, but the facts are, John Tyndall discovered that if you add carbon dioxide, it traps heat. It's a basic, it's a basic physical fact. Although the planet might be warmer 
anyway and make it... The, 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 there, will be, there are other reasons, and there always have been reasons, the planet will always get warmer and colder. There are hot periods and cold periods. However, the science is very clear. This gas traps heat. And so, therefore, it is very, it's almost primary school maths. If you add a gas that traps heat in massive amounts to the atmosphere, it causes consequences which you're now seeing unfolding. Well, that's really an amazing response. Notice that Neil there has brought forward a, a very good point, which is if you take the historic record of temperatures and CO2, the temperatures increased and then the CO2 lagged up to 800 years behind. And he's quite right. Here's the graph. But rather than look at the historic evidence and understand the process there, and by the way, what is the process? Very simple. There are 50 times the amount of CO2 in the oceans than there are in the atmosphere. 50 times. So as you come to a natural cycle warming of the oceans, the more you warm an oak water, the more you warm it, the more CO2 it gives off. Try warming lemonade or, or beer. You know, it, it, as you warm it, the CO2 is released from it just the same with the oceans. And so gradually, this huge amount of CO2 in the oceans, slight warming, gradually, gradually, gradually starts to give off. So it isn't the cause, the CO2, it's the symptom. And rather than deal with that issue, rather than, he refers back to Tyndall and the little experiments inside a lab, which is nothing like how the CO2 works in the atmosphere. William Happer, the world's leading physicist on the CO2 molecule, um, it really does explain this very well. And I've done videos showing how the CO2 molecule vibrates, how it stores energy. But this graph here, this graph here shows you that over time, as you keep adding CO2, it becomes less and less effective. So there's a huge amount of scientific information, historic information, which supports it. But this man just dismisses it and goes back to this really silly experiment in the 1850s. And of course, Tyndall was quite right. As you warm um, CO2, it vibrates more and it holds the heat. The, mon the atoms, if you like, are vibrating inside it, actually in a number of planes, and it really is good and efficient at holding heat. But as this graph shows, and um, Professor William Hopper explains, it becomes less and less effective the more you add. It's like painting a wall red, he says. The more coat you put on after two or three coats, it doesn't make it any redder. The initial coats have an effect by the steepness of the curve there, at the beginning when you add CO2. But as you add more, the curve flattens out and it's less and less effective. That's just a property of CO2. Basically, in the atmosphere, the molecules get in the way of each other. And also, in real life, a lot of the action of the CO2 is masked by water vapour. Now, I've done videos on this uh, um, in much more detail. But this simplistic approach by this man saying, you know, you warm it and that's it, and you add more, it's, it's hotter, is really primary school kid stuff. I mean, he doesn't know the most basic things about the science. Now, you should note here that he says there are natural cycles. There's, the Earth goes hot and cold. But unless you study and know those natural cycles, you can't tell the difference between what, what, what you can't tell the effect of what man has done with the contribution of CO2. It's not possible. You have to know what the natural thing is to understand any differences. It, it, it is quite remarkable. I did a little section, um, which I'm now going to show you, from Cli Climate Realism, episode two. Uh, and I'll just play that. It's only a minute or so long, but it gives you the simplicity of what's a well, it gives you the essence of what's being explained to us, that everything, everything is down to CO2. It's quite absurd. In the simple world of the climate alarmist, all you have to do to control the Earth's atmosphere is change the amount of CO2, increase the amount of CO2, and, well, hell breaks loose. <laughs> So all we have to do to get back to peace and tranquility is reduce that CO2. Oh, if life was so simple. We'd have no ice ages, we'd have no change in climate, it's CO2, it's all that seems to matter. Now let's return to Neil Oliver and that interview.
Water vapour traps heat yes. also, and there's much more. We produce much more in the way of water vapour, but nobody's demonising water. Um, there, there are many um, uh, global warming gases. They vary from carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons, water vapour, etc. All of them trap war, uh, carbon to a certain extent. However, so for example, carbon dioxide does, is around tw rate of 25. Methane is 100 times more powerful. Chlorocarbons are thousands of times more powerful. However, the biggest amount of, of additional gases causing climate change are actually carbon dioxide. How much carbon dioxide do you want to see as a proportion of the atmosphere? I think at the moment it's around the 400 mark, which is amongst the lowest levels it's been at in the last 50 million years. Where should it be for what you would regard as optimum life survival on Earth? The, the, the carbon dioxide currently is at 800,000 year high. What we need to see it is actually roughly in the middle of the last of the 19th century, which is 3.3. In, sorry, in the 19th century it was 280. The, 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 the scientists regard the danger zone is 350. So I, I'm not proposing we take it back to the 19th century, but if we can take it back to the middle of the 20th century at 350, we might avoid the danger. Wow, that's an incredible statement. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, let's actually not accept the 350, let's go even lower than that. Let's go back to pre-industrial times. When were the worst droughts? In the 1700s and 1800s. Here are some here. I am listing here the three worst droughts in UK history, 1765 to 68. That was actually the worst ever drought in the UK. 1784 to 1787 and 1854 to 1856. CO2 levels were pre-industrial at 280 or 285 parts per million, not 350, and yet we had the three worst droughts in UK history. You know, just, just on droughts, but if you take storms, let's look at some storms from the past. Here. Here is just one example. The 1900 Galveston hurricane. This is known as the Great Galveston Hurricane and the Galveston Flood are known regionally as the Great Storm of 1900 or the 1900 Storm. It's the deadliest natural disaster in United States history and that's when CO2 levels were below 300 parts per million, not the 350 safe limit this idiot is claiming. Let's look at, um, you name it, Hurricane damage, Hurric hurricanes in the past, massive ones, here. Well, let's leave America out of it. Let's look at the great storm of 1703, which was probably caused by a big hurricane sweeping up towards the UK, after hitting the USA, of course. The great storm of 1703, this was the most powerful wind force ever experienced in modern European history, causing more death and destruction than any known storm before or after. One third of the British Navy fleet sunk during the storm, which originated from an Atlantic-based hurricane. And CO2 levels? Well, they were pre-industrial, 280. But according to this man, we're all safe when we get to 350. I don't know how any sensible person could behave like him and appear on television as an expert. It doesn't matter what you take. Historically, when CO2 levels were very low, we had the worst disasters. Not, we've actually got less extreme weather now than we've had in the past. And no matter what you look at, that's the case. But suddenly, it doesn't matter. We go back to this magic wonderland area of, of life, as it were, where, where, where CO2 was low and things were just tranquil. They were lovely. The fact that CO2 levels were so low that plants were in a terrible grout position. And don't forget, our, most of our plants evolved in levels of CO2 higher than two to three times what we have now. So they are starving of it. This is why deserts are now retracting and so on. But no, I just can't believe that he's made that statement. And it just shows you how silly the entire alarmism thing is. But 
Let's continue. Andrew, how do you how do you react? Well, I'm, I'm sure, I, what I love about this debate, what I love about this debate is we're going to shine more light, less heat. It was interesting talking to Ben earlier, and I asked him the question: To what extent has humanity contributed? Because that's the question, isn't it? He did agree that there has been some sort of contribution. The question is quantum. So when you quote about eight hundred thousand years, I would first of all say, how do we know that? Because I'm not a scientist, as we may admit at the very beginning. What we need to do is work out where's the common ground. Well, that's very easy. The, the science, if you want. Want to know where the science yes, came from is actually scientists went to the to the Arctic, okay. which were there the thousands and thousands of years of ice records, and you drill down two miles right. and you pull it up and you look at the amount of CO2 okay. at every meter. And that's how they're able to tell the history of CO2 on this planet. So what do, you so th what do you say to people who say, look, hang about, throughout history, the planet's been warmed and so on and so forth, with Neil in his monologue at the beginning. What do you say to them? It's true. The planet has heated and got cooled. Well, what we haven't done is, is we've actually, as humans, thrown the equivalent of a million years right. of stored carbon every year into the atmosphere. So we are very, very fast changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And the chemical, atmosphere of the, uh, the chemical composition of the atmosphere has always changed. But the, co the consequences are terrifying. They happen over millions of years. Yes. What we are doing is over decades. So, so your common ground is that humanity has contributed is the disagreement as to the quantum of that contribution? The disagreement is, is actually um, is, is whether or not we take action. OK. And I would argue that's the problem. There is, you, you talked about in, in your intro about you know, the debate being shut down. I experience it quite differently. I look at the British media and I see the Telegraph, the Mail, the Sun, the Express, GB News and Talk TV, almost all fighting climate action. And I feel very, very despairing because actually I think the future of this country is at stake. I look at the science and the science predicted that if you add carbon, it gets hotter. And if you, it gets hotter, we does get it, consequences does such it as... Though, does it though? I mean, 150 million years ago, you know, the, 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 the temperature fell dramatically on the planet at the same time that levels of CO2 spiked dramatically. You know, and so and, the, and during the Eocene thermal maximum, right, when the temperature was higher than any time in the last half a billion years, the CO2 had been on a downward track at that point for 150 million years. So rising, the, the planet getting warmer and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't correlate in the way that you're saying that it necessarily well, does. There, there are other, there are many, many impacts on the temperature and on climate. What is irrefutable is basic physics, is that if you, if you actually measure the amount of heat coming through a gas, the carbon dioxide traps it. So there we are again, the simplicity of his case, which is the laboratory you know, experiment with CO2 traps the heat, which is you know, a true experiment. But as I've explained previously, it's absolute rubbish in the atmosphere, which is much more complex. I mean, one of the things, by the way, about the heating planet back is simply that as it heats up and there's more moisture, there's more clouds. And the clouds themselves are a controlling factor that stops the heating, it reflects radiation back. So there are natural balances on the short time scale, if you like, with clouds that are not properly modelled in any of the models. This man is, is taking a, a simple thing about CO2, as I've explained, being, being a gas that absorbs energy, and it does, um, but only up to a point, and as I've explained, once you're past a point, it becomes ineffective in the atmosphere. No understanding of that at all, just childish, well, unbelievably naive understanding of the physics here. Absolutely unbelievable. Now then the argument is, should we actually stop burning fossil fuels? In my view, should we take that gamble with future generations? The, the science will say there's a 1% chance. It will always say there's a 1% chance, 5% chance that the settled science is wrong. Well, the science is not settled, number one. And besides, besides which, what he's calling the settled science is wrong. Here's a simple graph of measuring the world temperatures by balloon and by satellite compared to all the models. I've shown it many times, but they are totally different. So we know the models are wrong because they don't get confirmed by actual observation. And that's a definition of being wrong. That's a definition in science of chucking out your system and starting again. So we know what he is calling the settled science is 
wrong. But he's now going to argue, of course, why take the risk? What would you get on a plane, he argues, with a 95%, only a 5% chance of it crashing? No, you wouldn't. But that is not the case. It's the exact opposite. There is no truth in their claims. There simply is not. The settled science is wrong. Always did that. But would you get on a plane that has a 95% chance of crashing? Oh, it's an interesting point. And, and what, what I love about this is that you talk about not having the discussion. The discussion is taking place. A lot of the people go too far. People like Just Stop Oil actually alienate a lot of people as a result of the actions they take. Whereas if you have a, a sensible discussion about it and say, look, these are the steps you need to take to make that make sense, what steps should we take and what difference will it actually make? Well, the, 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 what Just Stop Oil is, has a very simple demand which says stop investing in new fossil fuels to add to the problem and invest instead in energy efficiency, in renewables and storage. I mean, I think you're a futurist? Yes, absolutely. Um, I predicted 25 years ago, when I installed the first solar panels in London into my house, that in 20, 30 years the role of an energy company would be to manage energy, not produce it. Well, he's right there, because 25 years ago he was prophesy, prophesizing that now in the world, in the UK, we would have energy companies not to produce energy. I actually thought that was the basic role. No, no, to manage it, to control you, in other words, because that's the mad world he and his like have created for us, and the politicians have followed like sheep. You know, so he is right. Yeah, we're in that situation now. And as regards investing into storage and things, there's no, I've covered many videos on this, there is no viable way to do it. None at all. There is no such thing as reliable green energy, be it solar, be it wind, be it hydrogen, it's not there. So many videos I've done on this, I'm not going to repeat it here. Before I'll, I'll, I'll lose you because of time, what about mm. the argument that, uh, you know, uh, James Lovelock, he of the Gaia, argument yeah. you know he has recanted to some extent and now speculates or at least allows for the possibility that we might be the saviors of the planet by releasing more co2 that we that that what we what we are actually what we should be doing is actually increasing actively the amount of co2 in the atmosphere <laughs> because of the greening that it would enable gaia or the planet to perform. Uh, I don't and know would be, a more robust more fertile planet would be good for all of us uh, i don't know where you got that from I don't know where you got that from, he says. Well, how about the world record crops everywhere? How about the study by 42 scientists in, in 24 um, institutions, 12 countries, that worked together and found that in a 30-year period to 2010 that the world had greened by 14%. That's, uh, and 10% of that, two-thirds of that about, were actually due to CO2, the extra CO2. So we have world record crops now, world record rice crops, world record cereal crops in Africa and the Far East everywhere. That's where he got it from. It's very, very simple. It's why we pump CO2 into greenhouses and what we're doing is returning the CO2 that our plants have been starved and starved of. Don't forget, most of them evolved in much higher levels of CO2. So they're suffering a CO2 drought. So the point that Neil makes is spot on. Then he was spot on through this, and he couldn't do what I've been doing in this video in that. In, in that. But I got rid of my frustration in this video, if you like, by being able to counter this, well, ridiculous arguments by, by this alarmist, because... It drives me mad to watch, actually, and they, it really is um, just pitiful. In any event, I'd like to say thank you for watching this video again. I know it's been a reasonably long one, this one, but it maybe explains to you just how they try to propagandise you, and if you like, in, in, in on television. Uh, and how even when people like Neil argue against it, you know, this confidence of ignorance is, is just incredible. Anyway, thank you for watching. Bye.